All right, you guys, we have Katie Asmuth here with us. And of course, as usual, before you guys get to learn too much about her, we have to go straight into our two truths and a lie. So Katie, thank you so much for joining us. We are super stoked to have you. Um, how's your day going so far? It's going well. I'm super happy to be on this podcast. I'm a big fan of you guys. So yay, we're excited to have you. Um, why don't we just lay it out for the people? What are those two truths and a lie or a lie and two truths? (laughs) Okay. In the seventh grade, I won the youth pie eating contest at the county fair, Ventura County Fair. Mm -hmm. The second one is I've been to 38 countries. Okay. The last one is I've worked night shift at LA County USC, which is LA County general. It's one of the busiest ERs in the country. And yeah. Okay. All right. I mean, because I did your bio. (laughs) <laughs> like the last one's true. Um, pie eating contest sounds fun. Um, 38 countries is a lot of countries, but with your sport, I feel like it could take you to a lot of different countries. Oh man. But like maybe she's been to like 35. That's true. 40. You can trick us with the number. Okay. I'll go with that one is the live. But what do you think, Amanda? I'm, I think. I feel like I have to go with that one too. I feel like you could be a pie eating champion. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Definitely. All right. Well, do not tell us the answer. We will reveal it um, for the listeners at the end. But um, first, why don't we dive into what got you into running and running super long distances? How did this all come about? Um, I need to make sure I don't say the truth. <laughs> They might come out. They okay. might come out. Um, let's see. I it all started um, with a pie eating contest. <laughs> yeah, I'm really thinking exactly. I need to figure out. Okay. Um, so let's see. I really started running. Um, to be honest, uh, I was working at a very stressful job. <laughs> um, maybe, maybe not night shift. Um, and uh, yeah, so I we really started running for to just cope. Um, mm, I grew up mm-hmm. doing ball sports my entire childhood and, mm. uh, running wasn't really something I, and it wasn't a big deal in my high school. It just wasn't a big deal. Uh, I was really into team sports. And, uh, so, um, yeah, I started running, uh, during that time after just like a really intense time in my life. And my mom had cancer. I had to come oh, home wow. and I'm one of five kids and I moved back. I was, I uh, went to school in Chicago and moved back uh, to California to be closer to my family and, uh, to help out, uh, with my mom who had cancer who's now doing well and thriving. So amazing. That's awesome. Um, yeah. So that was a really just intense time in my life. And I started running during that time, just as an outlet. Um, and I think a lot of us do that, you know, is yeah. that it's kind of a way to meet people or it's a way it's like, mm-hmm. it, it definitely it's initiate something, <laughs> some sort yes. of growth and positive direction in your life. And that's what I needed at the time. And, uh, the idea of being a professional athlete was never manifested. <laughs> right. So, uh, yeah, that was, this has been really fun uh, journey to get to wow. now. So that's yeah. awesome. And how old were you when you kind of first started getting into running? Uh, yeah, I was about, I was after college. Okay. Um, so yeah, I was 22 Wow. Uh, and yeah, yeah. And I, I will say, so we, my husband and I went out on our honeymoon, we went to New Zealand and I, I don't even like to admit this, but I'm going to, we went to our honeymoon. It was 2013 and I read born to run Oh <laughs> we yeah. in New Zealand <laughs> and we were like, we're running everywhere because I grew up backpacking a ton. My dad was the, um, at his high school, he's a math teacher and he was the backpack backpacking oh, cool. like, instructor. Like they would go on backpacking trips over the weekends with the high school kids. And so the five of us kids would always go tag along. Um, but we, we would do that sort of thing. I grew up, uh, in a small town called Ojai in California and just in the mountains. It was a really great spot to grow up. And, uh, but I never actually run in the mountains. So it took our going to New Zealand to actually learn to run in the mountains and from there, I never looked back. It was like, oh yeah, I found yeah. the thing that I will love. So. That's awesome. Did you, with the born to run book, I know a lot of people after reading that went like straight to like the minimalist shoes. Did you <laughs> go that route? No, I did not. No. Okay. Like I was a clinician and was like, no, that's yeah. like a really yes. bad idea. A lot of Achilles issues I know yeah. happened after that. Yeah. Um, so and when did you, amounts, you know? yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, when did you enter into your first race or kind of realize like, 
I'm kind of fast. <laughs> yeah. So after our honeymoon, we actually came back. Uh, we were living in LA at the time and I joined trail running groups and learned a lot about the San Juan Mountains, the San Gabriel mm -hmm. Mountains uh, in Southern California. And it was just like totally eye opening. I mean, it went from being LA's, uh, you know, city to LA is just a trail running <clears throat> heaven. And it was really fun. That's where I met my best friends now. And I definitely created a community there. And uh, so it took a couple of years. Um, I, well, I had a baby, uh, in 2015. And so then 10 months later, I ran my first 50 K, um, wow. after the baby, but I had been like training, you know, before mm -hmm. then and, you know, during pregnancy, some, and that sort of yeah. thing. And then, uh, yeah. And then I had another baby and then, uh, so my first, uh, 50 miler was in 2018. And then I, um, also did a, uh, a hundred miler. My first hundred was in 2018 also. Oh my so. Goodness. Yeah. Good for you. That is amazing. And all this time, were you just, did you have a coach like helping you or were you kind of going by online plans or how are you going about your programming? I mean, I had no idea what I was doing. Like I wasn't a runner. I had literally no clue. So I reached out to a ton of different people at the mm -hmm. time. Um, I had heard of David and Megan Roach because they just mm -hmm. written written a book called the happy mm. runner. And I'd read that book and I was like, I really like their attitude that, you know, this is all just really for self growth and positivity and not, you know, having yeah. that stress about it. like, that's not why I run. And, um, and just like having to PR and like comparing yourself to others. And that's just never how I resonated yeah. in the sport. And, um, yeah, so I reached out to them and, uh, yeah, David Roach has been my coach since 2018. Amazing. Wow. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. And kind of with your racing experience, I mean, I've heard so many different things from clients and athletes in the past where it's like, they'll do a certain distance and they're like, yeah, that's enough. Like I'll back it off from there. What, what drove you to like, okay, 50 is good. Like, let's keep pushing that distance a little bit further. Was it like, was that too easy? Did you want a new challenge? What was, what was going on in your mindset at that time? Well, so my husband did Ironman and oh, okay. a bunch, I don't know how many he's done now, a bunch of wow. Ironman, and half Ironman. And so I, it was honestly, when we were talking about having kids, I was like, oh, hell no, I am not going to be the mom that just stays at home while you go off and do all these huge adventures and six hour bike rides. And like, nope, I need to go and leave for six hours and run in the mountains. <laughs> Hell yes. Like, Hell yeah. Well then sign up for something. <laughs> so I had to basically sign up for something to be able to like, you know, be able yeah. to account for leaving for a long time. <laughs> so it was a definitely my, my social hour, my sanity hours. Uh, it was awesome. yeah, just a way to have some me time uh, with small kids and uh, yeah, so I signed up for the longest distance I knew. And uh, it happened to be so Angels Crest 100 was my first 100. And all of my oh. friends in LA, not all, all of them, but a bunch of them were also training for it. And some of them, it was their first 100. And so we were kind of going through this together. Uh, many of us had the same coach. So it was really fun. We had a really wow. good group. And um, yeah, it was kind of crazy. I remember lining up for that going like, what like this irrational like ego? Like, how how do I think I can do this? Uh, but yeah. Um, wow. Yeah, it was, it was, it was really bad that I, I loved it. And then, and before that I'd done the 50 miler and I was like, oh, I wanted to keep going. It was so fun. Yeah. I didn't want the race to end. So I th thought that was a good sign. Yeah. That's awesome. When you're lining up for that hundred miler, did you have like a goal time in mind or were you just, I want to finish. I just wanted to finish. Yeah. Yeah. And Darcy Picky, if you don't know, she is, she's a legend in ultra running and, uh, and a mom and somebody I really look up to and she was racing. And so I was just like starstruck. And so the fact that I was like racing with Darcy and back and forth from first and second, it was just like a wild day. And wow. I was like really in shock that that's how the day turned out. And, um, yeah, so it ended up being a really good day and I was absolutely destroyed after, um, but it, it was really fun. Definitely ignited something new in me. Like, yeah, I'm never letting this go. So that's awesome. Yeah. And kind of through your journey, of course, we have to talk about sports nutrition, but like through your mm -hmm. journey, what, what were your experiences like with going all the way back to like New Zealand, reading born to run and starting running? Was it something where you're like, oh my goodness, I'm not fueling at all. And I probably should be, or like, what was that, you know, fueling experience like? Yeah. You know, in those early days, I didn't think much of it. I've always been a big eater. Yeah. Um, so like I said, I'm one of five kids. And so we were always like, you can imagine around the dinner table and like, <laughs> just like the kids, just like, you know, it's just like mayhem. We're all just yes. like reaching for, cause you have, it was like, you know, the last to survive kind of a, like trying to get as much food as you can in you. Yeah. Um, and yeah, and I was really active kid and 
I just remember eating a lot always. That was never really something I, I mean, really, honestly, I got really lucky. I think I had really incredible mentors growing mm-hmm. up and coaches and I, I, I went to small schools and I just never, I don't know. I, I didn't have to ever deal with the like body distortion or mm-hmm. any sort of, you know, disordered eating habits. Yeah. So that, that was, that was a really big privilege. I think as coming into the sport later in life, really, I mean, yeah. I started running when I was 27, so mm-hmm. 28. So I, I kind of, I, I lucked out in the sense that, so I guess I had started running when I was younger, like 22, mm-hmm. um, after college, but I didn't actually start running like, like, as like an everyday thing in the mountains with Mm -hmm. community, like a thing that I'm doing all the time. Um, you know, before it was just kind of like hobby jogging. And then I started becoming more serious when I was like 27, 28. So I think, um, yeah, I think I had just kind of, I was just came into the sport and I guess in a mature like mindset or just looked in it. And also, and I think, so I, I'm a family nurse practitioner. I work with a lot of folks that are underprivileged and Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. just underserved and a lot of homelessness, a lot of addiction, a lot of um, folks that are just really trying hard to put, you know, meals on the table for their kids. Yeah. And so I think I have that perspective a lot too, where I just really think that this is, you know, like I, I want to, I, I am very lucky to be able to run and yeah. I know that. And so I, for me, it was never about trying to be my, you know, beat myself or trying mm-hmm. to be the best or that sort of thing. It was just really about the joy that I get from the community and running. And so for me, fueling was just the fun part. Like I always like to eat fun foods and yeah. try new things while I was running. And, and it was just kind of a seamless transition and started eating more and more as I needed to. <laughs> with, That's awesome. Uh, yeah. So, you know, it took actually becoming a professional runner to being like, okay, I need to talk to a nutritionist. I need to like, make sure I'm doing this right. Um, yeah. and taking it more seriously. And I wish I would have thought about it mm. before and been more mindful about what I was putting in my body. I just put anything mm-hmm. I wanted, all the calories all the time. Um, but now I try and think about timing. I'm sure you guys, I know you guys yeah. talk about that on your podcast a lot, um, yeah. about timing of fueling and, um, and just how much protein and, you know, that, that sort of thing. Um, yeah. you're in, you know, your hydration and that sort of thing. So you just, you have to be more mindful, the more miles you put on your body. And, uh, if you really want to be, you know, the best, uh, you can be, it's about you making sure you're feeling the best you can also. So, yes. What were some of those like different kind of things you used as a fuel source when you first started that maybe you don't use now? <laughs> yeah. I remember bringing like trail mix. Mm. Um, I remember like, uh, I remember packing like PB and J's, you know, which I think are great, but just like not very efficient when you're trying to run faster, but for yeah. long days in the mountains, still fantastic. Mm-hmm. Um, I remember like, I remember one time I brought like beef jerky and I was like, why am I eat? like, this does nothing for me. Like oh, wow. I, yeah. I was just like trying to get calories. I wasn't thinking like the carb as much. Mm-hmm. And so, I mean, definitely that changed. I mean, I think when I started training for my hundred miler, it was like, yeah, like I, this is no joke. You have to you know, that's when I started understanding more and more about yeah. um, the importance of carbs. So with the ch- transition to more carb focused, what were, what are kind of some of the products you've evolved to using now in your training or racing, or, or is it different from training and racing right now? When you think about how you yeah. about it. Um, sure. Um, so let's see if I'm going out for just like a short jog, then mm-hmm. it's definitely different. <laughs> um, but if I'm doing, especially my long training, uh, runs, you know, in the mountains, I definitely, I pack like I'm racing. So mm-hmm. I want to train my gut, especially like in the six to eight weeks before a race, I am like very dialed and very diligent about making sure I have the products I'm going to be using during my race. Um, and really trying to like get in as much as I can. So there's kind of this, like, you know, I think in any race, it's going to be different in the sense that if it's really hot or if it's really cold or mm-hmm. if it's fast or if it's slow in the sense of elevation changes, but, um, so it's not going to be exact, but you can try, <laughs> you can try and aim for those three gels an hour. You can try. Yeah. Um, and that sort of dwindles off probably towards the end of your race, but in training, you can really prep the gut that way. And I really take that seriously because I know the importance of <laughs> having a solid gut when you're racing yes. that can Goodness. make or break your race. Yeah. Yeah. So are you trying to do um, you mentioned three gels an hour. Are you trying to do a feed like every 20 minutes typically when you're racing or training? Yeah. So, um, I, I used to, in the past, this was actually Western States was probably, was actually my first hundred that I didn't have 
a Timex watch also along with like my GPS watch. Um, so I would have two watches and people laugh at me like, wow, you're a noob. Um, <laughs> but honestly, it was great because the, the, you know, my other watch just didn't make a loud enough sound to remind oh, me yeah. to fuel. And I wanted to remember. So yeah. I would just wear this like double watch, like Timex, like totally like yeah. all it did was every 20 minutes tell me to eat. Nice. Um, and so that was really helpful. And honestly, now after doing it for several years, I don't need that anymore. Like I know that I just need to be constantly eating. Like mm-hmm. the second you forget about eating, that's when you need to eat. <laughs> um, is, you know, so basically, yeah, I think now I'm just more focused maybe, um, and just have the experience of knowing, uh, how much I need to be eating at all times. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, so but it definitely took some experience. I think the practice part of making sure you're getting in that fuel on, you know, if you're an endurance athlete, it's, yeah, it's, it's a whole nother part of the sport, man. Yes. Yeah. It's been one, of the, <laughs> yeah. one of the questions I always get asked for my clients that are doing longer stuff is talking about those 20 minute feeding mm-hmm. intervals. Do they start right away in the first hour or do you start right away in the first hour? I'd be curious I Start about 45 minutes in. Okay. Yeah, but yeah. I start really hydrated. Um, so I definitely am a big fan of having some salt before going out mm-hmm. like the night before I yeah. do some preloading, um, especially before a race, mm-hmm. um, even the, the morning of like, um, if I'm going out for a long training run or a race, I definitely like make sure I'm getting in electrolytes. Um, yeah. and then, uh, and we can talk about that, but, uh, so let me just answer the question. So I, uh, do that. And then I make sure that I eat before, like I've never, Mm -hmm. ever fasted running. Um, I don't know why somebody would do that. Maybe if they have a hard time running, but I think it's, wouldn't be good for me. I need to be fed, uh, but I have my coffee and I have my electrolytes and I eat and, you know, I'm not really like a stickler about what I just try and make sure I'm getting in carbs and a little bit of protein. Like I'll try and do like oatmeal with some peanut butter and banana or bagel or, you know, with yeah, the yeah. same or, um, you know, try and get something in that substantial mm-hmm. that, um, isn't going to kind of overload the dough. Like I'm not like yeah. down a breakfast burrito, but, um, maybe I should start drying. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Funny fact about breakfast burritos. I heard one of, um, my gravel cyclists, he takes the frozen Amy's burritos. He's a cyclist, gravel cyclist, and he puts them in his back Jersey pocket. And as the day goes on, they thaw and he eats them on his oh ride. My God. It's like, I've never heard of anybody doing that, but I guess it works for you. Cause he's, I think that's brilliant. Yeah. And it's different when you're a cyclist than you're yeah. a Cause you can take yeah. in a lot more. Oh you yeah. Know, you have the jostling, but dude, I love that idea. That's yeah. Cool. Yeah. yeah. All the fr- frozen f- freezer foods we could take advantage of. Um, so talking about the fueling, what's your go-to products that you love to use like during racing? So I am a huge fan of the feed. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm sure you guys are too, just because yes. the variety of what you can get on there. And it's just mm-hmm. kind of like a one-stop shop for all yeah. of your fueling needs. So for me, um, I, so I love bars. There's a, like bonk bars or tau bars. There's a lot of like bars oh, yeah. that I like just mm-hmm. as like quick snacks. And I use them a lot for like when I'm out and about with kids, yeah. and I just need to make sure I always have food with me. So that's a big one. Um, and then um, I use SIS. SIS has been oh, my yeah. go-to for uh, years now. Mm-hmm. I think I was one of like the early adopters and uh, for ultras at least. Yeah. Um, and I've been doing that for every hot race, like Western States. If it wasn't for SIS, I would be a disaster. So oh, shoot. SIS, yeah. um, now they have beta fuel. So it's mm-hmm. 40 grams of carbs. So, <clears throat> so that's really awesome. Precision hydration is one I use. Um, I like the beginning of Western States this year, I just had I think I ran, I think I had three in total, but like I had the 90 gram mm, uh, yeah. packets. And so it's great. Cause you can just carry it and just like, yeah. nom, 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 like, and the 90 grams goes down so easy because yeah. it's just, you know, you don't have to open the package so many times. So that's mm-hmm. nice. Um, I use some spring. Um, I really like awesome nice. sauce. I just, it's oh, all yeah. carbs again. Um, um, I use some goo products, some Morton. Um, yeah. So a lot of different stuff. And that's why they yeah. nice because I, I like to try different stuff. I just found out the SAS has a new uh, I think it was SIS, but it's like, it's like an ice gel. Have you is that SIS that? too? Cause I heard, um, never second, maybe, oh, maybe it's, ne- it's never second. Okay. Oh my gosh. It's totally never. Yeah. Second. The freezer. I just had an athlete try and use that yeah. uh, at their last gravel race. And he's like, they couldn't receive handouts. So it was 
melted by the time, like it wasn't uh, frozen gotcha. by the time we got to it. But in um, situations where, yeah, you can get handouts, like that's great. I mean, like aid stations, I'm like, oh, that's going to mm-hmm. be on the docket for next year. Right? Absolutely. It's fun. It's fun. Cause it's like different stuff. You get to try different things and it keeps you engaged during the race. Yes. You're like, Ooh, and you're excited. Whatever the mm-hmm. crew is going to put in your, in your vest. Like, what are you, yeah. what are you going to get this time? Um, yeah. so keeps things interesting. I feel like uh, I know some people, I, I always, the, the notorious picture, I don't know if you ever saw it, if you know Marianne Hogan, but um, she had an insane year last year, but Marianne, there's this amazing photo of her at Western States last year with this massive turkey sandwich at like, I think it was mile 62. I think it was at Forest Hill, but we wow. all laugh. Cause I'm like, dang, like I can't, I wish I could keep that kind of like solid food down during mm-hmm. racing, but mm-hmm. um, during training I can more, but during the race, I'm, yeah. I'm really like in go, go, go mode. Don't really want to sit and eat. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. Ham and cheese sandwich. Or something. <laughs> That's I know. hard. That's hard to get down. Yeah. I think the flavor fatigue is something that a lot of athletes run into when these durations get longer. Right. And so like all the products you mentioned, that gives you such a good opportunity for variety. And like you're saying a surprise, like you're not eating the same chew hour after hour, like that people just run into major GI issues. Like I feel like after that, or just like, yeah, they kind of feel sick. Cause they're like, dude, this flavor is getting old fast and it can be a lot for some people. Well, so it I, keeps things fun. Like we yeah. can all do it. Like, yeah. you know, like we're gritty. All our ultra runners could do anything. It's not about that. Like, yeah. Oh, you know, but it's more fun that way. It keeps things more light, exciting. Like definitely it's just, it's more fun. So I think we can do it. It would just mm-hmm. be more boring. <laughs> you yeah, know? Exactly. Um, so yeah. And I yeah. will say though, something that's really important when it comes to that, and I'm sure everybody listening knows about the importance of electrolytes, but um, it's really important when you have all these different products to know the amount of sodium that's in yeah. each one, because you can easily overdo it or mm-hmm. undershoot. Um, yep. cause then of course I, you know, I use gnarly nutrition for my, uh, my mm-hmm. hydration and mm-hmm. but you, I mean, you can definitely under overshoot depending on all the other Absolutely. products you're using. So you just have to be on top of that and your crew has to kind of be aware. Yep. Um, yeah. So the first year I definitely undershot my salt. And then the second year at Western States, I definitely overshot my salt. Mm. Uh, and this year was just right. So that was good. That Nailed was really it. Good. Yeah. But That's a sweat awesome. test helps. So definitely mm-hmm. highly recommend mm-hmm. getting a sweat test. They're pricey, but if you, yeah. Can't do it. yeah. Yeah. So you did a sweat sodium test. It sounds like. I did. So okay. my first year at Western States was, um, really, really, really hot year. And, um, and it didn't affect my, my gut or my muscles as much. It was just my, I was out of it, like mentally mm-hmm. just mm-hmm. Yeah. brain fog and just a little mm-hmm. dizzy and just wasn't myself. And I couldn't yeah. enjoy the day the way I wanted to definitely didn't perform the way I wanted to. And looking back, absolutely undershot my sodium. Uh, and then the second year, my team kept me so cool uh, that I way overshot my sodium. <laughs> so, um, wow. cause after my first year, I went and got sweat testing to know how much sodium loss I get when I sweat. Um, mm-hmm. and so I had to do all those calculations and I was pretty dialed in, like, I'm a professional athlete. I can do this and was really dialed. And then it turns out, uh, sometimes you just gotta <laughs> listen to your, your self yeah. a little more this year. I actually tasted a salt stick to see if it tasted good or not. Mm-hmm. And it definitely did not taste good. Um, oh. So I was like, okay, good thing. I didn't just pop that in my mouth. Like the year prior, I had just yeah. like, to bunch my mouth and, um, went on my way and it was too much. So highly recommend that's a good tip. Don't take yeah. salt caps, actually taste the salt to see if you need it or not. That's a good cue. Yeah. I think goodness, the sweat sodium concentration thing, I think like you're saying is so beneficial because everybody's fluid losses and sodium concentrations are so different. Like you're saying in different environmental conditions and cooling techniques and stuff like that, it can vary pretty significantly. Um, well, yeah, the set, the sweat test is the same, but it's just the amount of fluid you lose changes. Yeah. And so that's why it's important. It's nice to kind of have a ballpark of if you're a big sweater or like big sodium sweater or not. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's important, but then it, during the race, it's going to all change based on the variables of the day. And so, yeah. uh, it's really important to also keep in mind what tastes good. <laughs> yes. So, yeah, yeah, definitely. Do you, um, did you do the in lab, like arm patch test or mm-hmm. how did you? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It actually was through precision hydration. Mm-hmm. Again, I think I'm an early adopter. That was like years yeah. ago. Um, nice. so I, but I reached out to them and they had somebody <clears throat> and I, yeah, I, I went and went to their lab and had nice. it done. And, yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. Um, yeah, I would, I recommend that for all our athletes as well to get some sweat sodium data. Um, so we can do that 
the math basically for the different losses and different environmental conditions. Um, so talking about that, you were talking, you'd mentioned earlier, kind of loading leading into what does that look like? Are you starting like days before the night before? I just start the night before. Um, mm -hmm. yeah. And then the morning of, uh, just to make sure I'm like topped off. Um, mm -hmm. yeah, I definitely want to make sure I'm super hydrated. I think it's also, well, I, I should say I start drinking gnarly that whole week. I'm like just mm. wanting to make sure because it's not yeah. just, uh, the, the, you know, being extra hydrated, it's just like extra calories and carbs that I'm yeah. wanting also. So probably about Wednesday before a Saturday race is like, mm -hmm. I just start like drinking a lot of gnarly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Just like for any electrolytes in, out there, you know, um, and just make sure it's not like, Gatorade zero or something without calories. Like you want the calories, you want the carbs, you want that sugar. Um, yeah. so I think that that was, that's a, that was something I've learned. And, um, yeah, the, the pre, um, loading before for the salt, uh, just mm -hmm. to extra hydrate you to make sure that you're yeah. topped off and yeah. That's awesome. And mm -hmm. do you also do during that window, some like increased carbohydrate consumption or carb carb loading or glycogen supercompensation as people call it? Yeah. So the week of the race, I have very, very low fiber. So, um, you know, I like to eat healthy, but like, I don't know if some people would say my diet's healthy. I think it's healthy. I have lots of colors and yeah, good. it's healthy. I have two little kids. We try and yeah. keep it healthy. Um, but I also am just like need calories all the time. So yeah. it's, it's a hard balance. That's why we need nutritionists. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, dietitians, I should say. Um, so I, um, so yes, the week of the race, I do low fiber. So I like really cut out most vegetables, um, mm -hmm. and do like white breads mm -hmm. and like r white rice, uh, and just really try and make things pretty bland in that kind of way. Um, but then, uh, doesn't, it's not always bland. It's just, mm -hmm. you know, not like color rich just cause I want to make sure my gut is really like relaxed for the wedding, yes. for, the, for the wedding. I almost said wedding. Oh my God. <laughs> For the race, I'm already married. Yeah. Um, I'm also in like bachelorette planning mode for my sister. Who's oh, there. fun. Um, <laughs> yeah. um, so anyways, I, um, yeah, so I do that. And then starting about Wednesday is I really start focusing on like just carb, carbs, nice. lots of carbs. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. That's I awesome. still, I still have my regular protein. So I always have protein when I wake up, I mm -hmm. make a protein shake. And then I also have protein before I go to bed um, and then try and uh, just really focus on carbs the rest awesome. of the day. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So you mentioned like white breads and things like that. And then, and, um, do you do the gnarly, is it H what do they call it? Fuel two O. Cause it Fuel has carbs. Uh -huh. yeah. yeah. Um, do you do that too during the day? Yeah. So that's of, yeah. what I'm using. Yeah. Yeah. I use fuel two O 2.0, uh, during that whole week, I'll mm -hmm. be just downing lots of that. Um, nice. Yeah. And just, just again, like to get those extra carbs and calories in, I, it's just an easy way. Drinking yeah. the calories and carbs is just an easy way of getting it Definitely. in. And, um, and I like that has electrolytes on top of it. So yes. Yeah. And it's I clean. Claim. Yeah. Yes. I like gnarly cause it's, you know, certified clean for sport. So that's why yeah. I use them. <laughs> that is important. That is important. Um, the carb loading thing is one that I think people need to play around with, but you mentioned something that I think is really helpful is like including some liquid carbohydrate sources, because I've had too many clients where they're like, Oh, carb loading. That sounds fun. Like I'll just eat only bagels and it gets very tiring after the first day. Like, so do have some variety and some ways to, to help you get in those, those carbs. Yeah. Like switching it up. Like sometimes yeah. I'll do couscous or I'll do like, I like to switch up. It's just all pastas and bagels yeah. and breads and, but like all the carbs, you know, yeah. um, I think that's key. Like, I think fruit juices are also great. Yeah. Um, just ways to get in. Some totally. Carbs. That's awesome. And, um, so kind of jumping back a little bit to race nutrition, is there a certain carb target you aim for per hour or is it a calorie thing or is it just so many fueling? Yes, intervals? I aim for it. Yeah. Aiming <laughs> is definitely gold standard. Uh, so I aim for, I want 70 to 80 carbs nice. per hour. Mm -hmm. Um, and I, I usually get that in the beginning of the race, uh, towards the end, like it starts to dwindle in the sense yeah. that I'm just like trying to uh, go as fast as I can and not, I, I need to, I need to probably think about, um, the last couple hundreds I've done. Um, it's definitely been something like 15 miles to go. It's like, I barely took in any carb and I think yeah. it's a big problem. Um, I think I closed great this year, but I think I could have closed a lot harder if mm. I just like really thought about the carb intake. Cause at that point I was like, 
I just need to get there. I have 15 miles left. I'm just going to yeah. push as hard as I can. And it was like now more about grit and focus and mm-hmm. speed and like forgot about <laughs> like just hello. Yeah. Um, Cause I was so excited. I, you know, I was in like, we were third, fourth place battling and mm-hmm. it was just, you know, so I, I was less focused on that. And so yeah. that was definitely a mistake, but, mm. um, you know, there's always something to learn from. So I think yeah. if you could, if you could stay up on your carbs through the very end, if I could be taking in, you know, a gel with a mile left, that would be the best case scenario. Yeah. So you want to feel yeah. the entire day. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's great advice. Cause that it's a lot of clients run into that same issue, biking, running, whatever. They just get close to the end and they're like, I don't need it. Or like, they don't hear the timer go off. Like it's just, right. yeah. They just want to get because your belly's up. a little bit after running, yeah. you know, for 85 miles, you're totally, you're, not, you've, you're, you're ready to, to just have it end. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. Your you desire to, to eat yeah, is exactly. not the mm-hmm. desire to eat goodness. Less. And so. what about fluid ounces? Like with Western States, like what were you trying to like, would you vary it based off of the temperature of the day and like, where like the climbs that are coming, like, how did you alter your fluid intake per hour? Yeah, totally. Exactly what you said. Um, so it totally depends, but my first two years, I mean, I know we're talking a lot about Western States. I've run other races too, but this is, it's just easy because it's like Mm -hmm. very hot. So it's very fueling and electrolytes is so poignant for the day. Um, so I think that the first two years, um, I was actually aiming for two bottles an hour because mm-hmm. it was so hot. Um, yeah. two softies. And then this year I definitely didn't need that. I was going mm. more like one bottle an hour. Um, mm-hmm. but that is something that, um, it's what I I'm, I'm with experience. I'm, I'm more in tune to what I want. Um, and definitely think about thirst, but at yeah. times, uh, you forget, like you're, there's so much going on. I, people think that people are bored during long races, but there's so much to think about. And you're so engaged <laughs> the whole yeah. entire time that, um, you, you want to not forget to, to drink. So, uh, yeah, there's a balance of that, but this year I definitely consumed less hydration. Um, just because the, the two years prior were just so much, so warm, yeah. but you have yeah. to think about it because you have to pack for it, you know, and when you get your, to your aid station, you have to be able to have Mm -hmm. that, you know, extra ready. So there are times where like this year I was like, I'm just carrying weight that I know I'm not going to drink. It's a cool year. Um, And so I just dumped it. Yeah. I knew in prior years, I would have been like, Ooh, I'm doing that because I don't want to drink it and my belly hurts or something. But this year I was like, no, I'm just carrying extra weight. I want to be fast and I I don't need it. I know I'm not going to need it. So it just kind of depends on the, on the year. Yeah. That's interesting. Do you, do you ever set up your pack to intentionally skip or pass certain like aid stations or depending on how the course is laid out? Cause you have enough oh, yeah. or do you prefer to stop and refill? Oh yeah. This is like my favorite topic ever. So, um, it's really fun to sit down with any friend and like go over the elevation mm-hmm. course profile and figure out where they're going to pick up their pack or mm-hmm. drop bag or where they're, where, what they're going to do with their bottles. And that's really exciting to me because it's, yeah. it's, you really want to strategize about that. Cause that can make mm-hmm. or break your race. Um, for sure. You know, yeah. like if you are, you know, on this amazing descent, like you don't want to stop, you know, like you got to keep going. But if you're on this top of a huge climb and you're gassed, Mm. that's the time to take a break and grab Mm -hmm. your bottles, you know? So you just want to make sure you plan accordingly. Um, yeah, this year I actually was the first time that I didn't have a pack the entire time. I actually dropped my pack at mile 80 and then used a naked band, uh, Mm. and just put um, my soft flasks in there. Nice. And then had a handheld that was full of ice water and just doused myself with water and drank that if I wanted. Um, so that was a really nice way of doing it because the the aid stations were pretty close together at that point. And yeah. so it just kind of depends on the, on the, on the, how the race is set up and where the aid stations are. But mm-hmm. yeah, that's definitely a strategy that I enjoy. <laughs> just that's trying awesome. to understand. Yeah. yeah. That's, part, that's part of the sport. You know, ultra running is definitely logistics based. So. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, goodness over that duration yet yeah, you have to do some, some strategizing, as you're saying, you mentioned holding and running with a bottle or flask with ice in it. And so one of my questions was cooling techniques that you apply. That makes me think of like the Palmer cooling technique. Um, you know, is that, was that intentional for your palms or was that, and for obviously cooling your person, but, um, was that something that was thought about at the time? Like the palm cooling technique? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. yeah. Like all in. Absolutely. I've done all my research. So, um, Yeah. I mean, well, I did full ice protocol this year, even though it was a cool year. Um, mm-hmm. I want to be as cool as I can out there. And yeah. 
Uh, and even if you think of it's like a cool race, uh, you need to queue up cool, like unless it's yeah. in the fifties, you know? Yeah. Um, so even if like, you know, 68 degrees is going to feel too hot when you're trying mm -hmm. to push it. So, uh, yeah, I, I started cooling actually in the high country at Western States this year. I had, um, I had like two snowballs in both palms and nice. I touched my face with them because just even a little bit of fluid on your face, um, mm -hmm. a liquid on your face helps a ton because you're yeah. running. So you feel it, it cools you down. So, um, a lot of, uh, so I'd hold the, the, the snow touch my face. Um, also I have a handheld that is, um, like insulated. And then I have mm -hmm. a different one that's more like permeable in the sense mm -hmm. that you can hold it and it like, it's getting your palm cold the whole time. Nice. So I pack that with ice. Uh, and so it keeps my hands full. I switch it off each hand, you know, sometimes I hold both awesome. or something. Uh, and it's really, really helpful. Uh, yeah, I, I do a lot of heat techniques. I do the ice bandana, you know, ice in the arm sleeves. Another technique is you tuck in your, um, your shirt or your kit into your, um, I, I, I do it into the, that naked band, um, or mm -hmm. just like any running belt or your, your shorts, if they're tight mm -hmm. enough and then just put, put ice into your shirt so that the ice sits in your core and yeah. keeps the core cool. There's lots of techniques I've learned over time. Nice. Um, yeah. 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 Getting your, your hat. So having a hat that's really flexible is really helpful uh, because then you can kind of like scoop it up and go um, with water. And, and it, it, it's nice because then you can kind of take it off and use that also to cool you yourself. Nice. So there's a lot of ways, but basically you're just trying to stay wet as mm -hmm. much as you can. So, yeah. yeah. And the altitude too, it's so dry. It like pulls the water off your skin quickly, I would imagine. So keeping, yeah. keeping that coming is good. Those are all fantastic techniques. And I'm sure our listeners will appreciate that in the hot races that maybe they have coming up. Um, I do want to be mindful of your time here. So let's see, um, we will shift towards our two truths and a lie reveal, and then we'll let listeners know where they can find you. So you had said you do, 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 do one, you were seventh in a pie eating contest. You've been to 38 countries. No, I was in seventh grade, seventh grade, one of pie. pie. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> I did cliff notes here, <laughs> um, been to 38 countries. And then you worked night shift at LA oh, County LA general. LA okay. CSC, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. And we said the 38 countries was the lie. Which one was the lie? In seventh grade, I did not win the youth piting. Oh month. man. I was I hoping to hear third. that story. <laughs> oh, oh, oh man. Third. Are you so sad? <laughs> yeah. Shoot. Tell us about that. What kind of pies were these? So I went with the blueberry because, uh, I was like, okay, the apple, it was between blueberry and apple. And I was like, okay, the apple will be like too hard. Like the fruit is too big to mm. eat. And so I was like going for efficiency. <laughs> I think I started Strategy. This is yeah. very early on. <laughs> yeah. That perhaps you for gut training for ultra running. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> uh, so I went with the blueberry and I got down 10 pieces. Oh, wow. Like That's five awesome. or six minutes. I don't remember, but I was wow. like, really proud of that. And I still only got third. I oh was, man. man I that is something that. to be proud about. Yeah. yeah. I was that proud is impressive. Yeah. I do the, my best fueled client, um, he actually was a professional eater before working with me. So his gut training, no problem. Oh, that's amazing. Yeah. Like savage. It was impressive. <laughs> so, yeah. So it, it is a skill. Like it does <laughs> literally train your gut. Um, interestingly. Yeah. Can um, I ask you guys a question? Do you guys ever, do you recommend just eat it, like go for a two hour run and try and eat as much as you physically can. They, that is actually that? like, that is one of the techniques. So like gut training, you could do it different ways. One of them being like, you could eat a monster breakfast. You could eat a cheeseburger and then try and train. That could yeah. be one of the ways you could train your gut. Um, but, but it can be pushing and shooting for that target or a higher target than what you're going to use in racing. We try and have our athletes weekly progressively build that, um, over a period of time to help that tolerance and make it a little bit easier on them. But yeah, some people will just that, like, that's one of the techniques in the literature is they'll just slam as much as they can. And, and yeah. Yeah. But isn't it important to use the products that you are going to use during the race? I mean, part of it. Yes. Cause you need to learn how to open them and carry them. Right. But from a carbohydrate, um, receptors in the small intestine and the gastric emptying rate, like that doesn't, those don't necessarily have to be from the same products. Um, but 
but I do encourage definitely practicing with the products eventually, um, for sure. Probably earlier out, you could do practice with your cheeseburger and pizza. Like was it Dean Carnazes or whatever does that the pizza while he's running or something. Have you heard that? Yeah. Um, savage is crazy stuff. Yeah. yeah. But yeah, I would just, I would eventually use what you want to use and try and push it yeah. either slowly or aggressively <laughs> and then eventually it gets easier. But yeah, that's a good question. I once saw a lady pass me eating a tamale during, oh, I think she was running. That's impressive. That has it's like really beans and cheese and, but there's a lot of fat like, in that. That, yeah. that would yeah, might be like corn. a fat bomb. Yeah. That mm-hmm. might like not sit really well. He wants some mm-hmm. maybe, but I think there's yeah. like, it's like lard. <laughs> yeah. It seemed crazy oh, yeah. to me. She seemed really excited about it. That's I don't know amazing. If it was a vegan one. <laughs> that's oh yeah. Amazing. Wow. Goodness. I like that for um, after the race or like, yeah, that sounds run. good. Yeah. yeah. Salty and goodness, the kind of mm-hmm. sweet corn. Um, okay. So where can our listeners find you, follow you? Where can they? Yeah. Find? Really only Instagram. Uh, okay. it's K T like the letters and then mm-hmm. underscore. And my last name's Asmuth, A S M U T H. Awesome. So. We will link that in the show notes for the listeners. And then, um, this has been fantastic. I mean, super informative. The cooling techniques alone, I think are going to be super helpful for our listeners. I think that's fantastic for this time of year. And unfortunately you only got third in the pie eating contest. Maybe you're going to have to join another one and and enroll, but this is- I want to talk to your athlete. Yeah. (laughs) I don't think he's a professional eater anymore, but he was when he, you know, initially came to me and I don't know what's, I don't know if it was like hot dogs or what it was that he was a professional eater in. I'll have to check. I should follow up on that. (laughs) see what he was. And my goal is to beat him in eating pies. Yeah. That's the did, goal. <laughs> yeah. Well, did you know the initial, like the gut training research in endurance sports started from research on professional eaters? Oh, that doesn't surprise me. Yeah. Like, so that's oh, where yeah. they, it's all, it all has like evolved from is that's where they like, yeah. We're first pulling information from, cause that was all the information they had. And then of course we get to evolve just, it now. It's the thing. same thing just while moving. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Try running and slamming down seven through 10 pieces of blueberry pie. Um, yeah. goodness, but yeah, that I'll have to follow back up with him. Um, and, and let the listeners know what is, yeah, I think you need to bring him on the pod. I know yeah. I should, I'll circle back with he him. I don't know what he's up to this year. Yeah. I think he just had a baby. So he's busy with that, but he is still doing ultra stuff. So you're going to bring them on. Yeah. Um, awesome. This has been wonderful. I definitely appreciate your time here, Katie. And I know the listeners will enjoy this and we will link that IG so they can follow along on your journey for the rest of the year. And thank you again so much for joining us. Awesome. Thank you so much for having me. This has been super fun. Yay.